Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. Currently, I'm a member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and Twitch. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions in the GoToWebinar chat box. MS navigators are online throughout today's program, answering questions and connecting you with resources. Living with MS means learning to be flexible. Your particular MS symptoms may require you to redefine or rearrange certain aspects of your life, and some of the biggest challenges you may face could be at work. But meeting those challenges head on is a vital part of successfully managing MS and continuing your career. Today, we're talking about the impact of MS on employment and how vocational rehabilitation can help you define workplace accommodations to stay at a job or start working again. Joining me is Dr. Philip Rumrill, a professor in the Department of Early Childhood Special Education and Counselor Education at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Rumrill also serves as Director of Research and Training at the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute. For many years, Dr. Rumrill served as director of the Multiple Sclerosis Employment Assistance Service, which provided vocational services and support to people living with MS across the United States. Dr. Rumrill is a nationally certified rehabilitation counselor and has published on the psychosocial and vocational implications of MS, including employment issues and multiple sclerosis, and multiple sclerosis, a guide for rehabilitation and healthcare professionals. Dr. Rumrill will be joining us today by phone. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Rumrill. And Dr. Rumrill, thank you for joining us today. Well, John, thank you for having me. It's great to be here uh, with you all. Looking forward to this. Being employed in a rewarding and fulfilling job is important for so many reasons. And one of the most difficult truths about MS is that it can affect your ability to continue to work. Dr. Rumrill, why is someone's employment status important and how does it impact their overall well being? Well, you know, uh, employment in, in virtually every society in the world and all down through uh, uh, civilized history. Uh, uh, work is is such an integral integral element of uh, of uh, not just what we do but how we define ourselves and we we <clears throat> consider our identity our, our identities to be tied up in 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 working if you think about when you first meet a person at a cocktail party or on an airplane or in a restaurant you know the first thing you ask or you uh, share is your name and uh, the next question is, what what do you do? Um, and uh, that expression of what we do and what our and we and, and then we talk about our jobs. And so when you say I'm a I'm a plumber or I'm an architect, I'm a carpenter, I'm a nurse, uh, that has a set of uh, uh, of meanings associated with it, and um, uh, it, it it really becomes a core element of our identities. And if you think of it just from a standpoint of energy expenditure, we know that people between the ages of 16 and 65 or 68 or 70, and that outer age range is getting older and uh, and older as time goes on, people putting off retirement until later in life than, than ever before, 
But estimates are that we spend 50, 55, 60% of all of our waking hours between the ages of 16 and the time we retire, either preparing for work, training for work, thinking about work, getting ready for work, traveling to and from work, um, working, uh, and then corresponding related to things uh, about work. Uh, if you think about um, even with the uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, people who were uh, able to pivot and work from home, uh, some, some estimates have suggested that we spend even more time working now because we're always connected. So we spend more time engaged in the role of worker uh, than we do in any other life role. It doesn't mean that other life roles like parent and partner and spouse and family member, those may be more important than that of work, but we spend so much time uh, involved in work um, that it really does become a core feature of our of our identity. And we think of work as a conduit to, of course, a paycheck and economic self-sufficiency, but it's really more than that. The Minnesota theory of work adjustment says we derive 27 different things. They call them work reinforcers from working, and only a few have to do with monetar monetary compensation. In America, working is our primary um, conduit to health insurance and therefore health care. Um, think about the, uh, <clears throat> think about the uh, uh, opportunities for socialization and how many people have met their, have, have made friends and met partners and significant others uh, uh, at work. So the opportunity to socialize. Uh, access to opportunities for travel, a sense of achievement and purpose, and thinking about people with MS uh, and people with other disabilities, uh, for, for that matter, <clears throat> uh, work has been, has, the therapeutic benefits of, of work are very well documented. That idea of purpose, a reason to get up in the morning, to leave the home, uh, and to get out, uh, get out in, in, in the world. And so it's our access to uh, transportation provides that kind of purpose. The energy that we expend on working is good, uh, uh, good for us. And we know that people who work, compared to those who don't, whether that's because of disability or any other reason, um, are better off in many ways. They have greater financial resources. Uh, they have higher levels of life satisfaction. There's some studies that indicate longevity is higher. So at a very real uh in a very real way, um, work meets a lot of our needs for um, uh, uh, for uh, our lifestyle needs to meet our goals for identity for uh, formation, but our but our very health and well being are tied up, uh, you know, in, in it as well. And we also know about MS that as intrusive as the illness is, and we know that MS sometimes does affect people's ability to perform their jobs. We do know uh, for a fact that MS does not affect people's vocational interests. It does not, if you were a nurse prior to the onset of MS and you like being a nurse, you're still interested in the nursing field even though you have multiple sclerosis. You might not be able to uh, continue in the same capacity um, depending on, you know, on your symptoms and, and what the job required, but it doesn't affect people's interests. It does sometimes affect their ability to express themselves vocationally. And so we have to look for ways to uh, accommodate people's career choices to the newfound circumstances of uh, of their MS. But John, you've hit on it, right? It's a great way to start this, this program is to talk about the importance of work. It's a big deal. Uh, we would all agree and, and really accept this as, uh, as given, uh, but it's a very important part of, of who we are. Well, I know that you and some of your colleagues have conducted studies looking at people living with MS and employment. Can you share some of your findings with us? Well, um, yes. A few things we've 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 learned uh, over the years is uh, a thing we like to start with when we talk about employment and MS. And one thing that continues to strike us is the incredible labor resource that exists among people with multiple sclerosis. We know that as, as many as 95, 98% of all people with MS, and most of these studies were conducted in, in America, I must say, uh, but this, uh, many of these findings do hold internationally as well. But 90 to 9, 95 to 98% of Americans with MS have employment histories. It means they've worked at some point 
in the past. And John, this really owes itself largely to the fact that, you know, the average age of onset of MS is early to middle adulthood. And by the time MS um, uh, manifests itself, people have already begun their careers. Uh, we know that uh, figures between two thirds and 80% of people with MS were still working at the time of diagnosis. So on the day that the neurologist tells you you have multiple sclerosis, the, the, a strong majority of people with MS were still working at that particular time. Uh, and that's even given the, the time lag that often intervenes from the time you notice symptoms until you receive a diagnosis. Uh, as time and the illness progress, however, we do see uh, a, an, an unfortunate and we think unavoidable um, uh, attrition from the workforce. We see too many people disengaging from the workforce such that the employment rate for Americans with MS uh, right now stands at around 40% paid employment. So 60% of folks with MS are not engaged in the paid uh, labor market. So what we see is a group of qualified, capable, experienced workers uh, still working at the time of diagnosis, disengaging from the workforce, um, usually before retirement. A few other statistics that we know about uh, MS and employment, and these are all from people's, people with MS and their own perspectives, uh, by the way. This is in interviews and surveys with folks with MS. A few more things that are worth noting, I think. 80% uh, of all unemployed people with MS tell us that they left their jobs voluntarily. They made the choice to disengage from the workforce. About 75% of folks with uh, MS feel that they still have the ability to work. And as many as 80% of people with MS who are unemployed tell us they would like to go back into the workforce. So this attrition from the workforce, people leaving the workforce in large numbers, um, uh, is a problem and becomes problematic because of those statistics. So we have these qualified, capable workers productive um, uh, and experienced with a lot to contribute to our economy. They get their diagnosis. Soon thereafter, they leave the workforce, most of the time of their own choosing. And then shortly thereafter, uh, they begin to reconsider that choice and wish they could go back into the workforce. They also tell us that they feel they still have the ability to continue working. So many people with MS disengage from the workforce even before um, uh, the illness has rendered them unable to work. They feel they could still work, but they choose not to. And we, we certainly honor and respect the decision to continue working or not to continue working. But by the fact that so many people end up regretting the decision to leave the workplace, that's where we come in and wanting to develop interventions that will help more people who, who wish to continue working do so as long as they as as they're possibly uh, able to so these are some of the st statistics that we see with this qualified and capable group of workers uh, disengaging from the workforce um, and then wanting to uh, wanting to re-enter it and from a vocational rehabilitation standpoint John we'd like to catch people before they disengage from the workforce it's much easier and it's desired uh, on the, from the point of view of folks with MS, it's easier to help someone keep their job uh, before they lose it than it is to help them get back into the workforce once they've disengaged. So the issue of early intervention and in that early adjustment to MS, if we could start to uh, uh, help people and uh, figure out ways to help them consider alternatives that would allow them to keep working again as long as they wish to. And the vast majority of people with MS want to continue working. If somebody truly does not, it's not the right time for them, there are options there as well. But we want to find ways to help people stay in the workforce until or unless they make that decision armed with all the information that, that, is, uh, uh, that is available to them. Well, that raises a very good question, I think. Well, tell us what resources are available to help a person who may be living with a chronic illness or disability remain in the workforce? Well, there are three I would point to in, in particular. And for folks with MS, I always recommend the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. 
A large number of folks with MS uh, nationwide are members of the MS Society. They've got a tremendous uh, uh, online uh, presence and, and really excellent uh, uh, materials available that support employment. Employment has been a priority of the National MS Society for, <clears throat> for many years. The MS Society has been a generous sponsor of much of the research that, that I and my colleagues have, uh, have, have done over the years, John, and many of those findings that I just mentioned come from, uh, from grants funded by the National MS Society. We've had direct service employment programs to help people with MS stay engaged in the workforce as long as they wish to. Um, so I would uh, 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 direct listeners to the National MS Society's, uh, 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 their, their, um, their overarching uh, uh, website. Start with the main uh, website and, and work your way through the employment resources that they have. Another resource uh, in the United States and territories is the State Federal Vocational Rehabilitation or VR program. It's a free service available to people with not just with MS, but with other disabilities as well, that helps people to enter or re-enter the workforce. Um, uh, services are individualized and they are not means tested. <clears throat> and so uh, th that means it doesn't matter what your resources are. If you need assistance, they can help with things like uh, training, for a new career or, or, or to change careers or to establish your career in the first place. They can help with job development and placement uh, assistance to help you identify jobs. They can help you in, in determining what your needs for on-the-job accommodations might be so you can continue in employment. And you can look up the state vocational rehabilitation program in your state. There are local offices throughout, uh, throughout states funded mostly by the federal government in partnership with the states, and it's the nation's largest and most effective employment assistance service for Americans with disabilities. A third resource I always point to is the Job Accommodation Network, housed at West Virginia University um, and funded by the United States Department of Labor. This is an incredible online and toll-free telephone resource to help people with disabilities arrange workplace accommodations uh, that will help them continue in employment or obtain employment. They work with people with MS directly, so you can contact Jan <clears throat> and ask your own question. They work with rehabilitation and service uh, professionals who work on behalf of people who have disabilities. They work with employers. They've got a great uh, a website and separate um, sections on accommodations uh, for people with MS that are commonly used uh, in, in the workplace. Again, this is really oriented toward helping that group of people who are employed at the time of diagnosis, but not employed a few years later, helping people to retain employment and get back or get back into the workforce uh, as quickly as they possibly can, using accommodations to help address the limitations that uh, their MS has, uh, you know, brought about in their in their daily lives. So, I would say the National MS Society the State Federal Vocational Rehabilitation Program, and the Job Accommodation Network would be three very important resources I would start with. And perhaps before people think to look to those resources, can you talk a bit about the kinds of things that people should be thinking about before deciding to leave their job? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think there's there's a number of considerations that you know that that folks have to make and it is a it is it is a personal decision uh that should be made by the person himself or herself of course taking it with the support of significant others and taking information uh from healthcare providers uh, from the employer perhaps you know uh real you know taking all the information but making that decision oneself becomes uh a a, a, a very very important um one of the things that you really need, do need to look at is, and, and this is true, I'm sure, in other programs you've done, uh, John, in this series, is the person with MS really needs to become his or her own best expert on how MS affects him or her. It's so individualized and affects everybody differently, as we know, and you've got to pay close attention to how your symptoms are affecting you functionally in whatever environment you might, you know, you might be in. 
So what symptoms are you having? What difficulties are you are you dealing with? What areas does MS not affect you? Um, and so as you think about employment, you then think about the requirements of your job, the long-term prospects, your level of job satisfaction. Do you like the job? Is it meaningful for you? What is the impact uh, to you in continuing to work in terms of energy expenditure, in terms of the other roles that you have in your life? What would be the impact of discontinuing employment, not just financially, but in all those other areas as well? And that's a that's a thing that I think a lot of people don't think about as much. They think about how working and maintaining a particular schedule affects them currently, but it's hard to project what that would look like if you stopped. And one of the things we have to think about in terms of making a decision that is so um, abrupt and can affect so many different areas of our life as as stopping from work, uh, as stopping work, um, what will the effect of that be? Not just on finances, but on the other people uh, in your family and friends and things of that nature. It, will it give you time if you chose to stop working to attend more to your health matters? Or does going to work uh, help your health by uh, giving you uh, opportunities to get your circulation going and to get exercise and to get up in the morning and to be on a good sleep schedule? Is the work itself uh, provide some therapeutic uh, benefits? Does the stress of the job create difficulties for you in dealing with MS? These are the kinds of considerations that people make, you know, in thinking about what the next step. The other is family circumstance. Do, do, what would the impact be um, uh, if you stopped working on your household finances? Do you have a, a spouse, partner, significant other? Is that person employed? Do you have dependent children? Might you be caring for elderly loved ones in the home or outside? So what would be the impact there? Would you be eligible for disability benefits through the Social Security Administration, through a long-term disability insurance carrier, uh, perhaps? And so if you stopped working, would you have access to benefits that could help to sustain not only your income, but possibly your health insurance and, and therefore your health care? Those are the kinds of considerations. And before people uh, make that decision to stop working, you can arm yourself with information about all of these things. The other is accommodation strategies, as I mentioned, the job accommodation network. And one way to determine how you would accommodate yourself at work um, is to look at how you accommodate yourself in the home and in the environment, uh, in other environments and in the community. So what accommodation strategies? Are they compensation uh, for, say, cognitive impairment? Are you using uh, um, uh, iPads or, tab or tablet or laptop computers and apps to enhance and aid memory? Are you using mobility aids such as uh, uh, a, a cane or a motorized uh, a scooter? Do you have to modify uh, your schedule where you used to be able to do things for eight or nine hours a day and now you have to cut back to uh, five or six? Those are the kinds of considerations. And what we find is that the way people accommodate themselves in life in general uh, are often the most effective ways for them to accommodate themselves um, in the workplace. Can you work at home if that's an issue? Do you have the technology that you might need? Um, and with COVID-19, nothing to do with MS, of course, many people had to make that, uh, uh, you know, pivot as well. And um, there were, uh, you know, benefits and uh, uh, there were drawbacks to that as well, certainly, not the least of which include being socially, you know, isolated from others. But through technology, we can do a lot of things that we couldn't do 10, 15 years ago. And might that help to extend someone's career? As a vocational rehabilitation person, my own bias is generally speaking, people are better off working than not working, but that's not the case for everybody. And so taking full measure of your entire situation uh, through some of these factors is, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, I think probably the best way to make a good and informed <clears throat> decision that aligns with your best interests and those of your significant others. And John, bear with me, I'm, I'm coming out on the other end of a <clears throat> excuse me, a <clears throat> respiratory um, uh, uh, condition. And so my, my wind is a little compromised, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. Not a problem. Please take a breath, have a glass of water. <laughs> um, yes, water. sir. We, we, we've got more questions for you. Um, and and you know, knowing your rights can be an important aspect of maintaining your place in the workforce. 
So let's talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA for a moment. Can you tell us what the ADA is all about and, and why is it important for people with MS to understand this legislation? Well, the ADA is a really, it's a really big deal for folks with MS and for people with other disabilities as well. <clears throat> we estimate that there are as many as 1 million Americans who have multiple sclerosis and there are 63 million people uh, who have disabilities as per the definition set forth in the ADA. The ADA, the original ADA was signed into law by George H.W. Bush uh, in 1990. And at that time, and it has remained so, it was the most comprehensive uh, legislation passed by any country in the history of the world uh, that addressed the civil rights of people with disabilities. And the ADA was amended in 2008, and those amendments took effect in 2009, signed uh, in 2008 by President George W. Bush, and really redoubled and strengthened the protections that people with disabilities have access to. For example, um, <clears throat> one of the difficulties with the original ADA was the definition of disability. If you claimed you had a disability and therefore your rights were violated on the basis of disability, you had to demonstrate uh, functionally that, uh, that you had a disability under, uh, uh, under the law. And a lot of people with disabilities were not able to document their conditions and were therefore considered not to be covered <clears throat> or protected by the law. And so the ADA Amendments Act uh, uh, extended protections to people with temporary conditions, which was a very important uh, consideration. <clears throat> and it also uh, provided pres presumptive, uh, pr presumptive protection for uh, people whose disabling conditions fit into one of any one of 13 different categories. And one of those 13 categories was multiple sclerosis. So, if, so since 2009, if you've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, you are considered a person with a disability and you therefore are protected by our ADA Amendments Act. So it's a, it's a big deal. And with regard to employment, of course, the ADA provides uh, access and accommodations for people with uh, disabilities and prohibits discrimination. <clears throat> excuse me, in 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 several areas of social activity. Title I deals with employment. We'll talk about that more. Title II is called public services, and this deals with um, uh, government or government sponsored. Um, accommodations and services that are available to the public. So this is state, uh, city, uh, county, and, <clears throat> and state governments, and in some cases, the federal government. Uh, Title III is called public accommodations, and this is privately owned accommodations that are open to the public, such as movie theaters, restaurants, uh, transportation systems, uh, and transportation providers, shopping malls, grocery stores have to uh, provide accommodations and access to people with disabilities who would patronize those establishments and they have to have the same right to access those amenities of our communities as people who don't have disabilities. Also in communication systems, telephone relay services and things of that nature uh, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing <clears throat> and communication section of the ADA has spread out to uh, web accessibility, <coughs> excuse me, um, so information resources and online uh, infrastructure is also, uh, uh, people with disabilities have the civil right to access those. With regard to employment, the law simply states that every uh, personnel action, everything in the, in the um, human resource policy manual, every policy and practice of a covered employer under the ADA, has to be uh, written and administered without regard to the to the existence or consequence of disability. So people with disabilities have the same right to all benefits, privileges, um, opportunities associated with employment as non-disabled people do. And employers are prohibited 
from treating people with disabilities unfairly in the employment arena, ranging from how job postings are, are advertised, how interviews are conducted, how medical screenings occur after you've had an offer, uh, how promotion decisions are made, how discipline works, how benefits are administered, um, including health insurance uh, benefits, um, layoffs, termination, um, uh, people with disabilities uh, cannot be harassed or intimidated on the basis of, uh, of disability. So literally anything having to do with employment and uh, policies and practices, they have to be the same for people with disabilities as they are for, for, for people who don't have disabilities. It really is that simple. Title I also adds a provision that requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations that enable qualified people with disabilities. And again, remember, people with MS are presumptively covered under the ADA that enables them to perform the essential functions of their jobs. These accommodations can range from scheduling modifications to modifications to how the work is performed, to modifying minor duties of the job or eliminating them, <clears throat> to providing personal assistance such as readers or interpreters to help people access information. I mentioned schedule modifications. It's the most common accommodation used by workers with MS. Accommodations also could include technology, either upgrades or changes to existing technology that allow people with disabilities to, to perform the functions of their jobs or buying new technology uh, that might be, uh, that, that, that might help a person um, perform the, the duties of his or her position. Uh, I'm thinking here of a large print magnification machine for a person with a visual impairment, a voice output uh, or voice activated computer program where a person with a mobility impairment could speak into the computer and you can perform your functions and access the keyboard that way. This whole explosion of artificial intelligence and voice activation that we've seen in society at large with Alexa and Siri and and all of these other programs. And just and now that I just said Alexa, my Alexa just kicked on here in my background, just for example. Um, uh, so these these are helping people uh, to live and work much more functionally. And so these are the kinds of things that <clears throat> employers are required to provide these. Also renovations to buildings, making sure that parking spaces, restrooms, et cetera, are physically accessible to people with disabilities as well. <clears throat> Any aspect of the work environment needs to be accessible to people with disabilities, just as it is to people without disabilities. And the, the impetus for providing these is the civil right protection part of this is if a person has been discriminated against in the employment uh, arena in any of these areas, <clears throat> you can file a complaint with the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, they will attempt to resolve whatever the issue might be if you can't. If it can't be resolved, you can go to um, a federal circuit court, file a lawsuit against the offending party, and uh, people with disabilities can have access to punitive and compensatory damages if their rights have been violated in employment. And that process and procedure, John, is very similar uh, to the uh, process by which um, uh, women, racial and ethnic minority group members, people from different uh, uh, religions or sexual orientations are protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So they, they, they patterned um, the, the Title I of, of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, they patterned them after the employment protections available uh, to minorities uh, under under the Civil Rights Act. So in a very real way, the ADA is the Civil Rights Act for people with disabilities. It's a big deal. It's very important to know what your rights are. <clears throat> the National MS Society has great information on various aspects of the ADA, including employment. And I would encourage everybody to um, uh, 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 take a look and see uh, uh, what this really comprehensive law uh, provides in the way of protection. As you were talking about some of the accommodations that could be made in the workplace, I know that the ADA specifies reasonable accommodation be made. Who decides if a requested accommodation is reasonable or not? That's a great question, John. And the short answer is the employer decides initially 
because the employer is the one who is going to be paying for it. Um, so uh, the employer decides whether the accommodation is reasonable, the request that you've made is reasonable, or whether it would constitute what is called an undue hardship, meaning it is either uh, too costly, too disruptive, uh, or would negatively affect uh, co other coworkers and uh, and and customers. And um, uh, what constitutes an undue hardship? So the employer could say, yes, that's an undue hardship. We're not going to <clears throat> you're not going to do that. That could be subject to appeal to the e United States EEOC or part of the uh, <clears throat> or part of the lawsuit. So the employer makes the decision, but the decision is not necessarily final. Uh, that point, though, John, does underscore the importance of the person doing his or her homework, making sure that the request you're making is reasonable, that it's cost effective, that you're talk talking to the employer about how will, how it will enable uh, the employer, uh, the employee, the worker, you, to be more productive on the job. And uh, we find in working with folks with MS that the more you know about your accommodation needs and the more you can connect that accommodation to performing uh, your job in the most effective manner possible, the more cooperative the employer tends to be <clears throat> about implementing the accommodation. And before we get too sidetracked on the cost of accommodations, because when I say that, oh, it says it, it doesn't, it can't be an undue hardship. <clears throat> um, that might lead us to believe that accommodations uh, are, are very costly in nature. And some are, but what we do know is that the, is that um, the Job Accommodation Network keeps data on the accommodations that they recommend for people with disabilities. And specific to people with MS, we know that half of all workplace accommodations for people with MS, 50%, cost $500 or less to implement, okay? And 25% of all accommodations for workers with MS cost absolutely zero. They have no cost. Uh, these are these are tending to be scheduling modifications, allowing people to work from home, and sometimes these accommodations not only uh, don't cost anything, they have a positive benefit to the employer's bottom line because the worker is enabled to be more productive. And think about our current reopening economy right now, John, where we're moving toward a full employment kind of situation. How many employers do you see who are um, uh, scrambling in all areas of the country uh, to find employees, right? They're raising wages, they're having sign-on bonuses, there aren't enough good workers to go around. So turnover, uh, turnover becomes a very important uh, issue uh, when there is a shortage of workers, okay? And how about those qualified, capable, productive workers with multiple sclerosis? John, do you think in this economy right now, when there's such a shortage of workers and it's probably going to continue to do that, don't you think most employers would spend 500 bucks to keep a good qualified worker, uh, experienced, productive, seasoned worker uh, who may have multiple sclerosis but with accommodations could continue to do his or her job? They'd be very eager to spend $500 to not have that person have to disengage from the workforce. And so a full employment kind of economy benefits people with disabilities and makes employers more amenable to this notion of accommodations because, quite frankly, they need workers more than, than they have at any other, you know, really at any other time in our, uh, um, uh, you know, in our history. And that looks to be continuing. But even when employment isn't booming as much as it is right now, uh, turnover is the most expensive personnel cost for employers. You don't want to lose a worker and then have to, uh, estimates are that replacement cost for one person uh, is 100 to 150 percent of that person's annual salary. You just can't risk that in this economy. So we find employers being even more amenable to accommodations. We don't see employers generally, John, being uh, swayed much by the cost of accommodation, uh, that that's really not the issue uh, when it happens, when, when folks with MS disengage from the workforce. It's, it's, it's very rarely that it's because the accommodation was too costly. Uh, it's usually because even with accommodations, the person's symptoms don't allow them to continue uh, working, you know, from <clears throat> from their own point of view. But what we would like to do is have people exhaust all possible accommodation options 
before making the decision to stop working, particularly if they want to continue working. It's again back to that issue of personal choice and these accommodations we see expanding options for people and, and we are we're certainly all in favor of that. Well, Thanks for that question. I'm glad, to, glad to have the chance to talk about that. Thank you. No problem. Uh, before we continue our discussion, I'd just like to take a moment to welcome those of you who continue to join us. Please let us know what's on your mind. Type your questions into the questions or chat box in GoToWebinar. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering your questions and connecting you to the very best resources. Our Ask an MS Expert program takes place at this same time every Friday. So please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family and your friends. Whether you're experiencing difficulties in the workplace or you've been out of the workplace and feel ready to return, Vocational Rehabilitation Services can help guide you through the process of finding those accommodations that are going to allow you to stay on a job or start working again. Dr. Rumrell, there are a lot of different types of rehabil rehabilitation services for people with MS, but everyone may not be familiar with vocational rehabilitation. Can you tell us what vocational rehabilitation is? Yes, sir. Vocational rehabilitation is a federally funded program that's available in all states and U.S. territories. Um, it is designed to help people with disabilities uh, start or uh, resume, start their careers resume their careers following an interruption of employment or retain employment over time. And uh, you would refer yourself to um, a, a field counselor in the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. You would let them know what your goal is for employment. They would make a determination of eligibility for services based on the nature of your disability and your employment goal. They can conduct assessments to help you determine what kind of work you might like to do. They would do a thorough evaluation of your work history and all the skills that you would bring to um, a new employment situation. Find out if yours is a career change proposition or whether it's one where you want to retain the employment you do have. Connect you with resources in your community that could help with training, including college tuition and college training. Um, but also on the job training and supports, if you needed assistance uh, with a job that was that was new to you, even even uh, up to and including a, a job coaches who might help to facilitate your employment and help you figure out the new uh, requirements and rules of your of your new workplace. Uh, we so they provide on the job uh, supports as well. They will help uh, as job placement and job development and placement specialists. So you want to be. Uh, an architect, you've relocated to St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and you have your resume and your experience, and they can help you secure a job in that field. Um, they provide uh, no, not only job development services, which help you to identify all the particular positions uh, in the area that you'd be willing to uh, consider, to job placement services, which is helping to make the match between an employer's need for personnel and your skills and abilities. They will help uh, uh, can sometimes help with, with things like transportation uh, to and from employment, the provision of accommodations to get you started in, in the workplace. If you're interested in starting a small business, they can help uh, in, in developing self-employment uh, placements as well. It's available to people with any kind of disability. I mentioned before, it's free of charge. doesn't matter what your family or household resources are, and it is a, it is a free service. Um, and it is the government's oldest and uh, largest employment program for people with disabilities. So if you just Google vocational rehabilitation program in your state uh, or go to the state government website and you put those two words together and you'll get a link and usually it will say how to apply or how to get information. It's a very user friendly and straightforward uh, process and you can refer yourself or you can be referred by a healthcare professional, family member, social worker, uh, 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 anybody. But uh, certainly worth if you're thinking about uh, reorienting your career or you might need assistance in continuing uh, your career uh, as you are dealing with symptoms of, of MS, 
it's a it's a wonderful resource, and we 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 would recommend it to uh, uh, to everyone who's uh, thinking anew about their careers in light of their MS. You know, we've heard from Brandon, who says he's been experiencing some cognitive challenges for a few months, and he realizes he can't concentrate or remember tasks like he used to. And we also heard from Deborah, who told us that she's really battling with MS-related fatigue while she's at work. Will a vocational rehabilitation counselor be able to help people with these kinds of invisible MS symptoms, or do they focus on things like mobility challenges at work? It's a great question, Brandon and Deborah. Thanks for those. And, and Brandon and Deborah have hit upon two uh, and are experiencing two of the very most common effects of MS that create problems with employment. You know, and, and we think that cognitive impairment in MS is probably actually even underreported, um, and fatigue is certainly the most common symptom of the uh, illness altogether. And how about the interface between co uh, cognitive functioning and and fatigue? Right, when you're uh, when you're uh, not um, sleeping well and you're tired and you're experiencing fatigue, you're not concentrating as well as you as you did. And we'll notice that you know late at night, early in the morning, or after a poor night's sleep, we don't we don't think as clearly as we did. Our memory isn't as sharp. Our analytical abilities aren't quite as good as they were. So fatigue and 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 uh, uh, cognition. Uh, kind of go hand in hand, and many folks with MS are dealing with both of those considerations. And the short answer is that any and all effects of MS can be addressed through vocational rehabilitation services. Uh, I would submit that the majority of symptoms of MS are invisible uh, and not readily apparent to uh, the uh, to to an observer or to or to an employer. And with co with cognitive impairment, we're seeing a a, uh, a great uh, profusion of new cognitive support technologies. And some of these are not disability specific. Some of these are apps or applications that you can use on your smartphone or your tablet computer to help with memory, short term, long term, intermediate term, or with uh, executive functioning, kind of the organizing uh, function of the, of the brain, uh, keeping your schedules and reminders and prompts and things of that nature. Um, so uh, we're finding that people with MS are benefiting considerably from using uh, technology that doesn't make their doesn't make their um, the neurological that doesn't make the brain work any more effectively, but the technology helps to compensate for any cognitive impairment that folks might have. But treating uh, uh, treating the fatigue and the most common accommodation for fatigue issues in employment is, you know, actually schedule modifications. You know, can you take a nap in the afternoon to re to regain your strength for the afternoon shift? Might you have to reduce your hours? Is it better to work from home, et cetera? And so the VR, the voc vocational rehabilitation program can help with any or all of these, but these are really important um considerations in the ongoing employment issue and these two very commonly occurring uh, 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 symptoms. And, and both Brandon and Deborah, I'd also suggest an inquiry to the Job Accommodation Network, type in multiple sclerosis and cognitive functioning, and they'll give you a list of apps that people with cognitive impairments have used to address the specific kinds of, of, of cognitive issues you're having. Now, if you're having cognitive problems and you're not sure uh, how exactly it's affecting you. You can get a cognitive neuropsych neuropsychological evaluation. The state voc rehab program can help with that as well. That will literally pinpoint the geography of, of your brain, where your lesions are, and look specifically at the kinds of cognitive issues that you uh, might be having based on uh, the org organic changes to your brain that have occurred by M as a result of MS. So those give you a clearer picture of what specific cognitive effects you, you might be having. So they can also help with assessing uh, both cognition and physical functioning, like in the area of fatigue, and can help to refer you to specialists, for example, who might be able to, um, uh, who might focus on an MS clinic that might have experts in fatigue itself to take a look and do sleep studies and find out if you're getting the kind of rest is your exercise program or your physical exertion program, is that causing difficulties, et cetera? So the answer is yes, yes, and yes. The state VR program can help with those kinds of things. But with regard to those issues, I'm glad that uh, Brandon and Deborah both mentioned those examples because 
they very commonly affect folks with MS and, and left unaddressed, they can be very problematic in your ongoing uh, employment pursuits. So dealing with it proactively uh, upfront and, and using all the resources you can find to help is really the key. And Brandon and Deborah, thank you for your question. Uh, there was a study published in 2015 that reported that about 70% of people with MS weren't working when they applied to a vocational rehabilitation program. But those who utilized vocational rehab while they still had a job saw increases in their average weekly earnings and average number of hours worked. So can you talk a bit about the benefits of seeking vocational rehabilitation services early in your MS journey while you're still working? Yes, yes, absolutely, John. Thank you for that. My grandmother used to say, right, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I never knew what she meant by that, but it really speaks to the early intervention stuff that works so well in dealing with anything with MS. As soon as there might be an issue, you address it as soon as possible. And whether that's with any other aspect of functioning, whether it's to do with transportation, but with regard to employment, go and get the help before you've had to quit your job, before you've made that decision, while you're still working. So what we find in the state vocational rehabilitation program, 70% of people with MS who refer themselves for those services have already disengaged from the workforce. And the program can help you if you have, but it's so much easier to help you keep the job that you used to have. And most people with MS want to stay in the job that they have. They don't want to reorient their careers. But once you've made the decision to quit, you have no other alternative but to do that. So before your MS even becomes problematic, before it even becomes job threatening, when you're early in the disease process, maybe your symptoms are being managed quite well, that's the time to be thinking about those contingency plans for if you have exacerbations or whatever it might be. So that first statistic, John, tells me that if we could at the, at the day of diagnosis, if our, our friends and colleagues in, neuro, in, in neurologists, whoever gives the diagnosis, could say, you having any issues with employment? And many MMS clinics do this. Many neurologists do this as well. Here's a referral to a place that can help while you're still working. Because keep in mind, at the point of diagnosis, folks with MS mostly are working. So let's catch them before they disengage. And then the intervention they need uh, isn't going to be as extensive and we don't, and then they don't have to deal with the stress of being uh, uh, unemployed. What those other findings indicate from that 2015 study, uh, John, that you mentioned, is that if, we, if you come in seeking job retention services, uh, by the time you're done with the program, your employment prospects will be in better shape. You're going to be working more hours. You're going to have a job that's more durable. You're going to be earning more uh, per week, you're going to be working more hours per week. So these job retention interventions, it's demonstrated if you get there early enough in that early intervention uh, context, um, uh, we can make fairly minimal adjustments to your to your work life uh, that, that 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 really do end up paying handsome dividends. That's not to say that all is lost if you've disengaged, but the sooner the better. So when do you start dealing with employment related issues? As soon as possible, as soon as they might become apparent. Maybe even before that, you know, be always thinking about how is this going to affect my long-term career prospects? I'm gonna be very vigilant, that own best expert thing I mentioned before. You know how MS affects you, you're gonna pay attention to it, and we're gonna be proactive and very aggressive and assertive about solving these problems before they become uh, uh, too large to resolve. And that's true around symptom management and it's true of employment as well. John, thank you for that finding. It gave me the chance to kind of underscore the importance of early intervention and early response. I, I couldn't agree more. I was happy to ask the question because I, you know, I think that when you're living with MS, one of the things you learn to do, part of learning that flexibility that really helps in so many ways as you go through life. But part of what you have to learn to do is think about today and think about tomorrow. A little future casting in your head can save a lot of challenge later that can easily be avoided by taking advantage of, of something like these kinds of services. 
Absolutely right. And it, it's it's unpredictable. You know, it's hard to put a plan on something when you don't know when your next exacerbation is, is going to come along. And so we always tell people all MS is can be uncontrollable. So you, you're not in charge of that. But you might be in charge of all these other aspects of your life and the things you can gain control over or take control over. Do all of that because it's going to orient you better. And it's then when that unpredictable thing comes up, it's a small minority of the issues because everything else in your life, you've got it all kind of uh, squared away. So by being ready for the eventuality, luck, what do they say? Luck favors the prepared hand, right? <laughs> well, Dr. Rubrill, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us. You've shared some really important, really valuable information with us today. Thank you. It's great to be with you all. Good luck. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are resources that you can count on to be current and credible. To learn more about employment and multiple sclerosis, visit the National MS Society website at nationalmssociety.org slash employment. I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. I'll also remind you that the MS Society brings people together through peer connection programs like self-help groups, the MS Friends Helpline and Paired Program, and the National MS Society Facebook community. To learn more, please visit, visit the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash connections programs. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Don't just ride, bike MS. Bike MS is more than the ride of a lifetime. Whether you want to cross the finish line in person or take on a new challenge from anywhere, there's a Bike MS event that's right for you. Find out more and be sure to register at bikems.org. You can connect with the National MS Society along with others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I encourage you to like the posts, subscribe to the channels, and make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. Philip Rumrill for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webinar will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook, and you can also find it on YouTube. I hope you'll join us again for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future webinars. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Philip Rumrill and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices. <music>